Bill Hurd from Hackaday. Today we're going to be playing with Direct Digital Synthesis, otherwise known as DDS, and I guarantee you my mind's going to wander a bit on this, so let's get started. Direct Digital Synthesis is where we take a digital signal, digital value, and we run it into some kind of analog process, some kind of digital to analog process, and we create an analog value from it. The simplest version of this uh, is, is a counter. Okay, and so I'm going to uh, jump over to my, I've got my Altera screen op open, and I'm going to create a counter using uh, the CPLD board we saw last time. You could do this in a processor and count. You could use a counter that's built into the processor. You can use timers built into the processor. You can use straight hardware and no CPLD. Lots of ways, but uh, since we're going to be doing lots of things today, uh, I'm going to be doing it with programmable logic. So let me show you the setup here. Here's my Altera screen. Uh, this is Cordis. This is the free version. The In this case, uh, if you remember last time, I made a counter myself uh, just to show you how quick it was to uh, to to do one in uh, Verilog. In this case now, I've gone ahead and I've used a built-in counter called an LPM counter. Our first rule with CPLDs and FPGAs, use the global clock. Don't make your own. Don't try and uh, take the output of something and run it into the clock of something. So that's exactly what we've got here. I've got my input clock going to the global clock, and I simply are taking my cues out, and I'm running them to the pins I've predefined, and uh, I've preset it to be an up counter, and we're going to compile, and we're going to shoot it over to the bench just that quick. As I said, we're back over the bench. I'm going to uh, show you what we did here. Before I load this up, I want to show you exactly what we're going to do. So here's the counter you just saw me uh, working on over on the Altera. And what we're going to do is we're going to make that counter feed a what's called an R2R resistor uh, ladder or network or however you want to say it. But it's a bunch of resistors, and that's all. We're going to make a digital to analog converter out of just a count value going into uh, these resistors and then measuring this voltage out. We're actually going to throw it on the scope. Now, this assumes that these outputs act kind of linear in, in that they probably go to a, a very similar voltage each and have very similar outputs. This is just down and dirty. It's not the most accurate thing in the world, but we're synthesizing a signal, not making an accurate analog to digital converter. And these days CMOS and, uh, and the parts we have, they actually do do this pretty well. Um, and it's actually selectable in the part too, some of the parameters. So uh, let's load this up. Um, here's going to be the counter. And here's our little R2R network, and I'll get you on the scope here. All right, so I've programmed the CPLD, and I've powered it up. Here I've got my general purpose power supply. In this case, I'm making uh, uh, 3 volts that goes into the 1.8 volt is what the core of this runs off of, and then 3 volts for the circuitry we're going to be looking at, little programmer. And then I'm taking those outputs right to the resistors that we saw. That's these, and here's what we get. Here's where the counter starts from zero and just increments all the way up to uh, FF in this case and then starts over. So if you were to look at this very carefully, there's 255 distinct values, but running at speed, it just kind of molds together. And if, if I had to, I could stick a capacitor on here to make this even smoother. So here's our first waveform. Uh, we've created a ramp wave um, out of just a counter and some resistors. There's actually a uh, second wave we've already made, too. It's really the even lower-hanging fruit than the ramp wave. Let me show that to you. All I am doing here is I am adding my signal, uh, my next probe, my scope probe, right to the highest digit uh, bit. It was D7. So in theory, it's on half the time, and it's off half the time. And here it is. Uh, when the counter starts at zero, the, uh, it starts counting up. You can see the lower bits, but right at halfway when it goes from 127 to 128, D7 flips, and that gives us a nice square wave. So now I've generated two distinct waveforms with just a counter. Okay, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I, I am using a, a CPLD, a complex programmable logic device. And so what I've done is I've gone into my counter and I've t told it to turn on some more features. Again, this is the kind of counter I used with the, the library mode here. And so I've turned on an, a, a, the ability to reset it and I've turned on the ability to um, change the direction. 
So uh, real quick, just by doing the direction change, and what I did is I put in a, a toggle flip-flop, and uh, all I do is I, I catch the positive edge. And if you remember from last time, uh, we don't run, uh, to make an edge, we don't run it into the clock of something. We run it into, uh, into the flip-flop, and we catch it where the first one that's high while the last one is still low. That's our edge, and we can see the effect here. And now you see that the uh, the ramp signal actually starts high and counts down low. So uh, if if you're keeping track, we just made another uh, waveform. <laughs> it's a lot like the other one, but we've made another waveform uh, just by adding a, a couple flip flops. As you can see, I've started to add some circuitry here. In this case, I've got a comparator and a voltage source, and all this is just a. Uh, variable resistor that I can adjust feeding into the comparator and what that does is that allows me to create a voltage with the DDS using my R2R and then compare it to an outside voltage and when I make this voltage equal to the outside voltage the comparator will trip. Well that means I can using just some outputs and one input if I watch that comparator that means I can figure out what an external voltage is by using digital outputs and an input and you can do this uh, you know like on the Arduinos and those kind of things um, use just a couple bits perhaps to uh, figure out what your voltage is your, you know if, if you're monitoring a battery voltage or something like that here we see the voltage that uh, I've hooked up to it is the green line and the voltage that we're generating with the R2R ladder is the yellow so you can see then I can vary the green within you know compared to the yellow and the purple is our comparator. So as the voltage gets greater and greater you'll see that it takes longer and longer for it to trip the purple at the top or if it goes all the way down the ground or near ground that it spends most of its time in a tripped condition. Finally here I've added just a little bit of circuitry. I've got a set reset flip-flop on the up down. I've added a comparator. I've added an external uh, signal and I'm going to do a couple of things with those so uh, you know again what you don't see is I hit compile and then I download it to the uh, PLD and let's see what this is so if you're keeping track what I did I took the counter and I made it uh, when it counts all the way up it turns around and counts down so if you are keeping track here's another waveform I'm doing with again just some outputs and some resistors and finally, one last thing before I put the comparator away is uh, if you take that triangle wave we are creating and you, you do it based on the comparator, which says, oh, as soon as you get to the voltage, go ahead and turn around and go back the other way. What you end up doing is creating a voltage to frequency converter. So let's take a look. I mean, it's not great. You know, it's got some issues. So up to here, I've just been playing games with, with uh, some of the circuitry that uh, drives DDS. The real part of, of uh, d direct digital synthesis is a lookup table, is, is ROM or RAM. If, if it's RAM, you can actually sample into it, record it, and then play it back. If it's ROM, you can uh, pre-record uh, pre it or pre-calculate uh, 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 it. Um, and you can do things uh, you, you can't do uh, any other way by doing the DDS. So what I've done here, I'm going to show you that I've added a lookup table to the design and uh, we're going to go to a sine wave then. Here's what the circuitry looks like moving forward. I had to swap out my CPLD board and I just dropped in some cheap uh, uh, FPGA demo board. Uh, in this case it's a Cyclone 2 and I, I had to do that because the CPLD just did not have good built-in uh, ROM or RAM capabilities. In my case um, I could do I could implement a ROM, but I couldn't uh, preload it with an initialization value, and I want to initialize it with the value to draw a sine wave. Here's the design again. Uh, I had gone in and I had changed the device assignment to be an FPGA. This is cool. I mean, this, the whole reason to do programmable logic is uh, exactly this kind of thing to retarget. And uh, here's our counter. We were driving directly into the R2R ladder before. And now there's a lookup table in front of it. And we used to use uh, lookup tables all the time to make color lookup tables in the past. Well, this is a, call it a sound lookup table if you want, or a just a linear 2D waveform lookup table. 
All it is is a counter going in, and uh, I had created this with a wizard that allows me to specify the depth of number of blocks and how to implement it and everything. And then it allowed me to specify a file for its initialization. And in my case, I had created a file uh, using trigonometry to generate the, the, um, the values for the sine wave. So here's, let's get out of here. And so out of counter into lookup table, out of lookup table to the same pins we were doing the R2R. Let's check the results. Here's our sine wave. And if you were to look, uh, you can see there's little itty bitty jaggies in there because I only used eight bits to make the sine wave. Uh, but to kind of prove this isn't just one of my signal generators turned on, if I remove some of the bits, you see that the waveform changes in new and interesting ways. And this is just quite simply where the table's not getting, every, not getting the right data bits anymore. And there's my sine wave back. Let me show you one last waveform. It's, it's, it's kind of nonsensical, uh, but it's something we can do with DDS. So let me show this to you. So here in the just for fun department, I made a signal that does two pulses of square wave, two pulses of triangle wave, and then two sine waves. So let's see you do that with your, uh, your regular frequency generator. Finally, let me show you the kind of thing I would use to make DDS if I were doing a new design and uh, didn't have a real reason to run analog to digital convert, I'm sorry, digital to analog converters and blow off pins and FPGA and resistors and that kind of thing. And quite simply, I would uh, uh, look at the available DDS specific chips. Um, here's one on the bench. This is an analog devices 9837 and it's right here. It's just a small little critter right there. And uh, I, I grabbed this one just because it was sitting in a uh, development board. You know me, I like development, um, these, these small development environments for uh, playing around. And, um, you know, again, it speaks I squared C. You don't have to blow off pins, three wires, and you've got your DDS output. So let me show you the capabilities of, of this uh, up on the scope. Here's the little application that shipped with the little evaluation board here. And uh, here's the output on the scope, and we can do a lot of things. But basically, this is about storing two different frequencies and uh, allowing you to switch between them. For example, you could do a frequency shift keying, where you uh, jump from one frequency to the other, or phase shift keying, where actually the signal just jumps 90 degrees phase shift and back to zero, that kind of thing. Just like I, I did earlier, you can uh, make a ramp wave out of it or whatnot. But here, here's the ability to switch between the two frequencies just with a toggle switch. And you can also do uh, sweep generation, that kind of thing. Add anything to this that does uh, SPI, you know, the serial protocol, the three-wire serial protocol, and you can make your own uh, functional test generator, you know, and you can actually uh, sweep a frequency from high to low. And if you look at that on the scope and trigger it right, you'll see the frequency response of something. So we'll... We'll do that in a different uh, video that's more about um, certain kinds of testing. So that's it for this video about direct digital synthesis, DDS, uh, which is really a name for what we've been doing for many years, which is just mixing some stuff together, half in the analog, half in the digital, to get what we need. In, in the old days, as a matter of fact, when we needed to make a sine wave and, and the, the proms, the EPROMs, were slow and expensive, we didn't even map the whole sine wave. We, you, you, if you looked at a sine wave, you could, hey, I could map the positive half and the negative half, right? Uh, so I'll just use one, one half of a sine wave and then I'll flip the sign. And then you look at the remaining sine wave and you realize that the rising part is, is the same as the falling part. So you flip it again. So we used to store just one quarter of a sine wave in an EEPROM table or PROM table uh, for whatever sine wave we needed to make. And, and thank goodness we don't have to be stingy like that these days. So again, Bill Hurd from uh, Hackaday. I uh, hope you uh, learned something and, or enjoyed it, if nothing else, and we'll catch you on the next video.